Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at the respiratory control of acid-base balance. Now to begin, you know that there are three, and if you don't, watch my previous video, there are three chemical buffers, major chemical buffers in the body. The phosphate buffer, the protein buffer, and the bicarbonate buffer. Now the phosphate buff buffer, that first one, it is a great buffer, but it mostly works inside cells and at the kidneys and our renal tubules. The protein buffer is great also inside cells and is probably the most abundant buffer in the body. But the most important buffer clinically is this one, the bicarbonate buffer. Now let me explain how this buffer system works. As you know, buffers resist changes in pH. And all pH is, is how much of this bad boy we have. If we've got a lot of hydrogen ions, we're acidic. If we don't have enough, we're basic or alkalinic. So the great thing about buffers is that effectively, let's ignore this part and just go from here onwards. That is called carbonic acid. Let's write it down. That's called carbonic acid. And we know the definition of an acid is it hates itself. It splits itself apart to release hydrogen ions and something called a conjugate base. And in this instance, this conjugate base is called bicarbonate. You can call it bicarbonate ion because it has a charge associated with it. So this acid can be released to produce hydrogen ions, and bicarbonate ions. But because it's reversible, we can also go in this direction to produce carbonic acid. Now, unlike other buffer systems, we've got another side of it, another attachment to it, which has to do with carbon dioxide and water. So let's have a think about this, right? Our body makes carbon dioxide. It makes carbon dioxide as a byproduct of metabolism. Now, think about this. You are eating food to ingest proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, carbs, right? You wanna turn proteins, fats, and carbs into ATP, energy. How do we do it? Simple. Proteins, fats, and carbs are made out of three elements. It's made out of carbohydrates, oxygens, and hydrogens. With the exception that proteins also have nitrogen, right? But the nitrogen doesn't contribute to making ATP, to making energy. So let's just remove that. So all three of carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. And you know that when, and if you don't, watch my metabolism videos, in order to make ATP, we need the mitochondria. We need the electron transport chain. And let's just say we take carbohydrates, we take glucose. We want to rearrange that glucose molecule. So what's glucose? Glucose is C6H12O6, right? Carbons, hydrogen, and oxygens. Carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, right? If we want, we can make it like this, just so it matches. Carbons, hydrogens, oxygens. We wanna rearrange this glucose molecule because we wanna pluck off, I said pluck off, pluck off the hydrogens because a hydrogen has two things. It has a positive proton and a negative electron that we say is flying around it. So if we steal the hydrogens, we can take the protons and the electrons and give it to carrier molecules called NADH. So let's take the hydrogens and let's give them to NADH to form uh, NAD to form NADH and FAD to form FADH2. So basically these are just carrier molecules for hydrogen. They're carrying the proton and the electron and what do they do? They hand the hydrogen ions and the electrons off to the electron transport chain at the mitochondria, and its job is to produce ATP. If you wanna know the specifics, watch my video on the electron transport chain. What's my take home message here? My take home message, as you know, I always go off track, is we're getting rid of the hydrogens when we undergo metabolism. What are we left with? We're left with carbons and oxygens. Carbons and oxygens, when we bring them together, can form carbon dioxide. So the point I'm making is the byproduct of metabolism, making ATP, making energy, is carbon dioxide. It's the exhaust fumes of the body. So we need to get rid of it. So every tissue in our body is producing carbon dioxide. 
that means we're producing a lot. So we have developed these beautiful lungs that can breathe it out. But to get there it has to go from the tissues into the blood. And the blood is mostly water, or at least has huge amounts of water. So the carbon dioxide will inevitably mix with the water. And in doing so, forms something called carbonic acid. But because acids, like I said, hate themselves, it will split itself apart to form hydrogen ions. And now we've just made the solution slightly acidic. Carbon dioxide can produce acid. Carbon dioxide can act, is effectively acting like an acid by more carbon, if I increase the amount of carbon dioxide in my blood, more will bind with water, producing more carbonic acid, producing more hydrogen ions. Effectively, carbon dioxide can produce hydrogen ions. So if I undergo a lot of metabolism, I can produce a lot of carbon dioxide as a byproduct, producing more acid. But thankfully, we have lungs and it's not a closed system. That's why this is called a volatile acid, because volatile meaning it can be gotten rid of very easily, right? So thankfully, metabolism occurs, we produce heaps of this, it's not stuck in the body, we breathe it out. Beautiful. If I, that means I reduce my carbon dioxide, reducing my hydrogen ions. But carbon dioxide isn't the only pro producer of hydrogen ions. So it's not only we produce carbon dioxide from metabolism and that's what makes our hydrogen ions, this can happen independently of carbon dioxide. So for example, you can have uh, lactic acid being produced from exercise. That's just one example. You can have lactic acid being produced and that produces hydrogen ions independent of the carbon dioxide. Now what happens? Doesn't matter. That hydrogen, as it accumulates, will bind to the bicarbonate forming carbonic acid, forming carbon dioxide and water. We produce more carbon dioxide and we breathe more. We just increase our ventilation. Now, think about it like this. If our hydrogen ion levels go up, the great thing is our body has a number of mechanisms that can detect not only hydrogen, but the carbon dioxide. So for example, let's just draw the left-hand side of the heart. So there's the left atrium, there's the left ventricle, there's the aorta, as we go around the aortic arch. So the aortic arch has three branches, right? So you've got one branch, two branches, three branches. So that's the brachio, if you just want for completion, that's the brachiocephalic, Brachio meaning arm, cephalic head, because that then turns into the subclavian to feed the arm, right? And then that's called the common carotid. Then we've got another common carotid, and then we've got the other subclavian, right? But the point I'm trying to get across here are these two common carotids. As they go up to feed the brain, they split to form an internal and external common carotid. Now, what you're gonna find if you have a look is that there are some bodies some cell bodies present in the aortic arch, which we call the aortic bodies, the aortic bodies. And we've got some of these bodies at the bifurcation, the splitting from the common carotid to the internal and externals, and we call these the carotid bodies. And they have chemoreceptors, and what they can detect are hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide. This is what we call our peripheral, our peripheral chemoreceptors, chemoreceptors. So that's great. If the hydrogen ion concentration goes up or our CO2 goes up because they're linked, they trigger neurons. And so there's gonna be neurons here and here, and where do they go to? Well, they're gonna to travel to the brain, right? So we've got our, there's our brain from a side view, not a roast chicken. Underneath, you've got our brain stem, which is our midbrain, our pons, and our medulla. Midbrain, pons, medulla, there. And this, these neurons will travel to the brain stem, go to the respiratory zone, and say, hey, increase ventilation. That's if we have high amounts of hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide. Hey, increase ventilation, brilliant. If I increase ventilation, I drop 
my CO2. That's great. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to drop that. And if that's lower, this is lower. So that's great. I wanted to drop that as well. So this is how we uh, tell our uh, respiration, or I should say ventilation, to increase because of that system. Now, and a few other things that we need to talk about here is this. We, because we can control the amount of hydrogen ions through breathing, let's just do a quick experiment. Right now, hold my breath. <gasps> Now, if I'm holding my breath, I'm not breathing out that carbon dioxide. That goes up, that goes up, that goes up, that goes up. I become more acidic. Okay, great. But because I become more acidic, I sense the peripheral chemoreceptors. You can also have the hydrogen ions and the carbon dioxide can directly stimulate the brainstem. That's called centro, central uh, chemoreceptors, right? So it's not just in the peripheral. So that's central chemoreceptors. But as I hold my breath, that can happen and trigger me. Let's override and breathe. <sighs> and breathe. Now, if I don't hold my breath, I hyperventilate. <laughs> I reduce the carbon dioxide, reducing carbonic acid, reducing hydrogen ions. This is why we say that this side of the equation is controlled by the respiratory system, right? And it's a short-term control mechanism because I can do it right now. I can control my blood pH just by breathing, right? So that's brilliant, our short-term control. If I increase metabolism, I can increase carbon dioxide, increasing the amount of hydrogen ions. It's okay, I'll negate it by breathing more. Great. But what happens if your respiratory system doesn't work properly? So what happens if I have an anxiety disorder that forces me to hyperventilate. <laughs> I'm breathing out all of my carbon dioxide, which means I drop the amount of CO2 I have, which means I drop the amount of carbonic acid, which means I drop the amount of hydronons. That means I'll become alkalinic. Alkalinic. Al alka. See, I can't talk and write at the same time. Alkalinic or basic right? Through hyperventilation. And because I hyperventilated, right? Because I hyperventilated, that's a respiratory, so it's a respiratory alkalosis. Easy. That's a respiratory alkalosis from hyperventilation. What if, however, I were to not be able to get rid of my carbon. So I got rid of too much in my hyperventilation. What if I could not get rid of? And it accumulated. So what could cause me not getting rid of my carbon dioxide? So think about it. Anything that stops your lungs from being able to get rid of your carbon dioxide. So anything that affects the lungs tissue, anything that affects the muscles that control the lungs, anything that affects the bones, that surround the lungs, that are attached to the muscles and the tissue, anything that affects the neurons that tell the muscles to contract. So you could have uh, things like polio affecting the, the neurons and the muscles. Uh, you could have uh, rib breakages that could affect the way your ribs expand, so breathing. You could have uh, tissue issues, so you could have uh, scar tissue forming, or you, uh, you could have blockages in the pipes, like emphysema, right, chronic bronchitis, all these things can reduce the amount of carbon dioxide you breathe out. CO2 increases. Hydrogen ions therefore increase, and you don't become alkalinic, you become acidic. You become acidic. And you become acidic because of respiratory-based causes, like I said, it could be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, like emphysema, or uh, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis specifically. It could be uh, due to, uh, what did I say? Um, uh, bone breakages, so rib breakages. So rib breakages. It could be due to polio, so viruses that affect the nerves and uh, the, the muscles. That is a respiratory acidosis. It's a respiratory cause of an acidic problem. So this is basically anything, as you can see, anything that changes the CO2 to directly affect whether you're alkalinic or acidic is a respiratory cause of 
acidosis and alkalosis. What do we then do? Thankfully, we've got the other side of the equation. What about bicarbonate, right? If that goes up, why can't we just increase the amount of bicarbonate? We can, to bind it up and mop it up, right? Why can't we just pee out more hydrogen ions? Why can't we do something on this end of the, we can, which is why this end of the equation we know is regulated by the renal system, but it just takes longer. It just takes longer. So it's long term control from hours to days. So we just have to wait for that to kick in. Okay. We're going to talk about the renal control of acid base balance next. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.